We welcome you once again to our John A. Widso Foundation podcast on the New Testament. Come follow me, uh, the theme for the study of all of our scriptures. And so we're happy today to be joined once again by our, our good friend, uh, Peter Huff. Peter's at the uh, uh, Benedictine University, you recall. And Peter, nice to have you once again. Great to be back with you. Thanks for the yeah. invitation. Let's dive in. Let's go to Luke 22. And I think let's read. Peter, why don't you read the first six verses for us? All right. So Luke 22, verses 1 through 6. And you're reading from the New Revised Standard, right? Uh, this time I'm reading from New American Bible. Okay. Now the feast of unleavened bread called the Passover was drawing near, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to put him to death, but they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, the one surnamed Iscariot, who was counted among the twelve, and he went to the chief priests and temple guards to discuss a plan for handing him over to them. They were pleased and agreed to pay him money. He accepted their offer and sought a favorable opportunity to hand him over to them in the absence of a crowd. Okay, thank you. Let me let me ask Peter, um, how is how is Judas Iscariot looked upon um, by Roman Catholics? And, and, and maybe in the same breath, what is a son of perdition from the Roman Catholic perspective? Well, I think all Christians see Judas as both fascinating and horrifying, um, and also mystifying altogether. Um, there is no particular Catholic doctrine on Judas, so it's not an article of belief. Right. But there are particular trends, if you will. Um he is counted among the 12. He is an apostle. So that's a huge status. Mm -hmm. um, he's at the Passover uh, that is about to be narrated. Um, John speaks of him leaving. We're reading Luke. We don't have the exit of Judas there. there from the so we don't know exactly how far into the Passover and Last Supper Judas participated in. And that's kind of a crucial question for Catholics because uh, this is where we see the origin of Christian priesthood and uh, the office of the bishop, the Christian mm -hmm. bishop. So Judas could be a Christian priest and Christian bishop uh, and the first rogue Catholic bishop, if you will. <laughs> you know, from, from um, a Latter-day Latter -day Saint perspective, we, we he's called a son of perdition. Uh, from our perspective, a son of perdition is someone who has received a tremendous amount of light and understanding, um, maybe even in the form of, of angels or visions. Uh, and basically... Uh, Joseph Smith used the phrase, knows God and sins against him. Hmm. Um, so I think a person has to, from our perspective, has to be tremendously, uh, have tremendous spiritual experiences, but then not be true to what he's received. Um, and so on the one hand, we could say from a Latter-day Saint perspective, uh, his is a I think his is such a tragic position. I mean, when I reread this, uh, I guess maybe my heart shouldn't, but my heart goes out to the guy. I'm thinking, this is awful. I mean, uh, you've been with the light of the world. And, um, and you know, and we won't go into this, but there are all kinds of theories as to why he's doing what he's doing. And, and some of those explanations are for good purposes. We don't usually go into the good purposes. We're, we're persuaded that when you betray the Son of God, you've betrayed him. And yet I would add this. At least one of the, our presidents of the church, Joseph F. Smith, um, Joseph Smith's nephew, 
he suggests that because Judas hadn't yet received what we call the gift of the Holy Ghost that comes at Pentecost, that perhaps his, his uh, position and or his punishment is not as horrible as, as might be the case if he were fully endowed with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Yes, and I think that's an important point, and I think Catholics could uh, follow that and, and agree with that. All of the disciples, all of the apostles at this moment, um, do not fully understand the Christian mystery. Yeah. So Judas certainly would share in that, and yeah. that would... Um, that would, to some degree, uh, influence our understanding of his responsibility. Yeah. W without minimizing the horrible act that he committed. Very good. Verses 7 through 13 deal with, of course, Jesus sending two of the disciples into town to make arrangements for the Passover meal, um, the, last the Last Supper. Um Verses 14 to 20, let me look at those, and I'll, I'll read those if I can. When the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire I have desired, I think that means I've really desired to eat this Passover uh, with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament or the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Um, Peter, I think it would be very worthwhile for our Latter-day Saint listeners. Could you give us a, a capsule summary of the doctrine of, of transubstantiation so we can understand it better than we do? Uh, and then we'll talk about a Latter-day Saint perspective on it. Sure. So um, as you well know, this is a, a core doctrine uh, for um, the Catholic community and really uh, the heart of Catholic practice, uh, I believe. Um, the actual doctrine that um, Catholics are obligated to believe is the real presence, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, in the Lord's Supper, in communion, whatever term you want to use. Uh, and that means the real um, spiritual presence of Christ and physical presence of Christ. So Christ meaning, is Meaning he's with you. Yes, yes, physically and spiritually in the consecrated bread and, and wine. Okay. Transubstantiation is a way of explaining that. So no Catholic is actually obligated to believe in transubstantiation. That's just one way of trying to explain the mystery of the real presence of Christ. And it's based on medieval and classical philosophy and science where um, everything has a substance uh, that is invisible and uh, we have accidents. So you and I are human beings, that's our substance, uh, the, and that's invisible, but what is visible are the accidents. Some people are tall, some are short, um, you know, all the different features that, that we can describe. Uh, so very briefly, uh, transubstantiation talks about the changing of the substance of the bread and of the wine, whereas the accidents remain the same. It still tastes like bread. It still tastes like wine, looks like bread, looks like wine, etc. The substance, though, has been changed from breadness, if you will, to the actual so, person of Christ. But again, that's uh, this, a, then, a medieval this, way of uh, explaining it. Uh, the, the actual obligation is to believe in the real presence. Okay, okay. Um, you, you know, Latter-day Saints uh, look upon it as an occasion where we can um, reflect pretty heavily upon the mission of Christ, what he accomplished in terms of his, his life, his teachings, his miracles, but more importantly, 
his atoning sacrifice, the shedding of his blood, the, uh, the body bruised and broken. Um, and also a time to do some serious introspection, a time to look back on the week and, and, and uh, we see it as an occasion where a person, if they have come to the sacrament meeting, our worship service, and partake of the sacrament, uh, and they've done so in a, in a, in a spiritually uh, serious way, that person can enjoy a remission of sins through the sacrament. Uh, and so remembrance, um, you'll often hear Latter-day Saints, a time when we come together to renew our covenants. I think that's part of it, but I think it's really an occasion to do some serious thinking about Jesus. Uh, if we haven't done very much during the week, we ought to be doing some then. Um, and, and again, a sacred occasion, enough for us to just simply call it the sacrament, the sacrament. Yes. Even though there are many sacraments. Okay. Anything else we had to say? Well, it, it is interesting. We both use the language of sacraments, and uh, that's very fruitful for dialogue. Uh, I think often um, a dialogue between a, a Catholic and a Latter-day Saint includes a third invisible person, uh, and that's the Protestant Reformation, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is, you know, uh, part of the Christian family. Um, but for Latter-day Saint Catholic dialogue, uh, I think we can set that aside and talk about other issues, uh, as you as you suggested. So rich field for exploration. Okay. Um, let's look at 22 verses 31 through 34. This is, this is to me a pretty sacred occasion, I think, and, and we don't spend much time talking about it. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, here we're at their last supper. Be, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I just uh, took occasion to look up a few other translations uh, to this. I hadn't done this before, and, and it's actually kind of fascinating. Um, in fact, how does... Uh, I'll, I'll summarize. It's a matter of... Um, Jesus, I mean, this is this. I, I assume this is uh, uh, something that only Jesus and Peter know about this conversation. We assume others aren't necessarily listening in. Um, Simon, Satan wants Satan's after you, he wants you uh, for all the reasons we can understand. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Here's what I wanted to ask you how, how would it feel to have Jesus say to you, I've been praying for you, Peter? That would be uh, amazing, lot. awesome, humbling to the extreme. I've been praying for you, Peter, that your faith fail not, or that, how is it rendered in the translation? Read it from, from that translation. Uh, yes, but I have prayed that your faith may not fail. Uh. And once you have turned back, you may, you must strengthen your brothers. Uh. I don't know of any other place in the new test in the gospels where jesus tells someone i have prayed for you yeah i mean i would feel thrilled if he had said to me i've thought about you once or twice <laughs> <laughs> yes right i remember your name <laughs> the savior's been praying for you what a what a profound thought you know yes yes um and and i just have to mention one other thing uh it is striking uh he uses the name simon Yes. Uh, whereas previously he had given him another name, mm -hmm. uh, Peter. Uh, but again, uh, Satan is mentioned. So in the confession of Christ at uh, Caesarea Philippi, uh, Peter gets the new name uh, and then doubts um, what Jesus is saying in terms of uh, the future regarding crucifixion and passion. And uh Christ says, get behind me, Satan. So here again, his name is used, but now back to Simon, uh, but Satan is mentioned again as well. Yeah, I, I did find, here's N.T. Wright's translation of this passage. I like this. 
Simon, Simon, listen to this. The Satan demanded to have you. He wanted to shake you into bits like wheat. But I prayed for you. I prayed that you wouldn't run out of faith. I thought wow. that, that's a very colloquial way of putting it, isn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Let's move, let's move on. Uh, again, I think we, we said once before, uh, but let me just repeat it in one minute, and that is the real serious conversion of these, these good men, these disciples, apostles, takes place, one, following the resurrection, and two, with the, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And you see, you see men at, at, at this stage you know, a very caring, very, they love the Lord, but they, they stumble, they, they make unwise decisions, or Peter's impetuous, or you read the opening chapters of Acts, and there's the total transformation. I mean, yeah. these, are, these are solid, uh, indefatigable disciples, fearless. Peter saying to, in Acts, saying to the leaders of the Jews, we really ought to obey God rather than you, rather than man, you know. So, that that conversion would take place with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Yes, so we see the uh, the impending betrayal uh, here. Simon is warned about denying uh, in just a few paragraphs. Uh, all disciples will abandon. Yeah, very very different after the coming of the Spirit. Okay, um, let's move down now to. Um, verse 40 i'll say for the benefit of listeners uh, it's fascinating that peter and i are involved in another dialogue in los angeles we meet twice a year our conversation just weeks ago was gethsemane right yes. so we've discussed this uh peter why don't you read 39 through 46 for us all right then going out he went as was his custom to the mount of olives and the disciples followed him when he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not undergo the test. After withdrawing about a stone's throw from them and kneeling, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will, but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. He was in such agony, and he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground when he rose from prayer and returned to his disciples he found them sleeping from grief he said to them why are you sleeping get up and pray that you may not undergo the test let me ask uh, about verse 46 first and then let's go back and deal with the more important part what do you what do you see as the test he's talking about um you know, from King James, it would be, um, why sleep ye, rise and pray, lest ye entered into temptation. Yes. What's the test or the temptation? Um, I think, I think that's hard to say. Uh, yeah. that, that's a very good question. Um, what I see happening in all of the Gethsemane narrative is, um, the actual enactment of the Lord's Prayer, mm. uh, Jesus praying to Abba, uh, Jesus eventually saying, "Thy will be done." Uh, and here it's it's the uh, the petition to uh, lead us not into temptation. Yeah, uh, but Christ is applying that to this specific critical moment. So I think that is behind uh, behind the. The narrative and the action um and and i think jesus is saying this is the ultimate test the ultimate temptation to be with me or deny betray abandon me yeah i think that's well said let's look at the verses uh, a little closer clearly from verse 39 it seems that they've spent some time in the garden of gethsemane before yes a place where I assume he taught them and, and uh, they had maybe, maybe great spiritual experiences. Um, verse 42. What's the cup, Peter? What's the sometimes called the bitter cup? 
Right. What you see is that. Uh, well, this is not the first time Jesus has used that uh, term in terms of a, a, a cup. Um, he asked the disciples earlier, are you able to drink this cup with me? Are you able to be baptized with the same baptism? Are you, are you willing to go through the same things I'm going to have to go through? Yes, yes. So I, I think it's the cup of suffering and passion. Um, and we believe that Jesus is fully divine and fully human. Uh, we can never completely understand all of that at the same time. Uh, but we understand certainly the human part, the the fear, the um, the uh, the unknown, uh, the threat, etc., um, and often not knowing what the consequences will be. Uh, perhaps knowing that suffering is coming, but not the full meaning of that. Yeah, um, given. I mean, yes, given that he has never experienced anything anywhere near the magnitude of what he's about to experience even um, you know fully god fully human even so it's something he's never experienced and i think he knows very well it's going to be a horrifying experience yes so even though he knows he will suffer or must suffer he hasn't done that yet so he that's doesn't right. know what it will that's right be like uh, fully and you know, um, uh, President Brigham Young made this comment. He said, uh, the father withdrew his spirit from his son at the time he was to be crucified. Jesus had been with his father, talked with him, dwelt in his bosom. The light, knowledge, power, and glory with which he was clothed were far above or exceeded that of all others who had been upon the earth after the fall. Consequently, at the very moment, at the hour when the crisis came for him to offer up his life, the father withdrew himself, withdrew his spirit. That is what made him sweat blood. If he'd had the power of God upon him, he would not have sweat blood. Um, we're talking about a kind of an anguish that uh, most of us could never comprehend, I suppose. Um, I guess there have been examples historically of people sweating blood, if, I, if I've read some of these uh, medical journals uh, correctly. But it's not a very, it, it has to be a kind of anguish and a kind of excruciating pain. Uh, interesting that word excruciating is related to the word crucifixion mm -hmm. uh, that, he's, that he's about to go through and that he begins to go through. And I think the, the irony too is this. This is something he's never experienced, not just the pain. He's never experienced the father withdrawing his spirit from him. Yes. So many times, and, and especially in the Gospel of John, constantly talking about the closeness between the Father and Son. Uh, my Father hath not left me alone, for I always do those things which please him. But then when you think of here and then on the cross, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're right. The human element is clearly coming through. Uh, he's already begun to feel something uh, yes. agonizing. Uh, and and uh, Catholics will often uh, focus on that term agony, uh, and often that's uh, the uh, short description of this episode, the agony in the garden. That's a typical phrase that Catholics will use, and it's uh, one of the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, one of the methods of prayer in the Catholic tradition. So seeing Christ in agony uh, is something that uh, is... Uh, uh, part of Catholic devotional practice, uh, but certainly uh, nearly impossible to comprehend. You know, um, Elder Jeffrey Holland, one of our apostles, uh, delivered an address some years ago called None Were With Him. And in there, he, he, he begins to address this question of, did the father forsake his son? And he, he said, did, did he leave him, basically? And Elder Holland says, um, I want to say that I, I don't think the father was ever closer to his son than he was right then. But that Jesus might experience what all of humanity is going to experience when they sin, when they when they do misdeeds, when they when they choose unwisely. Um, he's going to lose a portion of that spirit that he that he has had almost in perfection most of his adult life. 
and that uh, something he's never experienced before. Um, I mean, often I used to say to students, now you and me, we've sinned enough to where we're pretty used to having the spirit leave. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is another situation entirely, you know. Yes. And uh, of course, in the Gospel of John, uh, this this episode comes after uh, Jesus is teaching about the intimate unity between Father and Son. Right, right. Um, maybe another thought here, Peter. Uh, is there a tradition at all as to who the angel might be? Not that I know of. Um, and Catholics are not shy about naming or identifying <laughs> angels <laughs> as something we might have in common. Uh, but here, um, I'm not aware of any particular tradition that uh, identifies this particular angel. Well, there's nothing official. Uh, one of our, one of our uh, apostles back in 1985 in General Conference said, he basically saying, I'm wondering if it isn't Michael, yes. uh, the archangel. Right, right. Um, the other question I'd ask is, one of the translations I read about the angel strengthening him, and the, the translation said, oh, I think it was the, the uh, Revised English Bible said, basically bringing him strength. Hmm. How do you, how do you, what do you feel? What do you see? What do you think when you hear strengthening him? It's certainly not comforting him. No. Uh, because the, the reference to agony yeah. comes after the visit from the angel that's right the angel so, comes, then the agony comes yeah so there is profound suffering and agony um but yes i, I that that sense of strengthening seems to be you know the ability to actually move through those experiences yes yes and and curiously of course just a minute ago you know we were talking about simon um that's what jesus said that Simon could do strengthen his brothers ah when the when the trial came yes yes you know Peter because we talked about this a few weeks ago that the Latter-day Saints have a uh, a fairly distinctive view on Gethsemane that for us the atoning suffering begins in Gethsemane is continued on the cross in fact the elder McConkie in talking about this occasion said all of the agonies of the night before recur on the cross. Mm -hmm. our, our current uh, president of the church, President Nelson, used the phrase, they are intensified on the cross. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we would see the, the it, it, we would see it as a, a complete package, if you will. Suffering here, suffering continues there. Uh, in both cases, suffering that, that withdrawal, that no longer allowing him to have that closeness, that intimacy that they had had at least for a period of hours. Um, I'm also fascinated in verse 44, being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Hmm. It's hard to picture Jesus having an unearnest prayer, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but it does suggest to me something quite wonderful, and that is, Prayer is very often situational, the, depending upon the seriousness of the occasion, you find yourself either offering a brief prayer or find yourself on your knees for an hour, pleading with the Lord. And he prayed more. This is the son of God that never did anything wrong, never prayed incorrectly, prayed more earnestly. What do you think? Yes. I, I think this is the ultimate moment of prayer for Jesus. Uh, and as you say, uh, we can't minimize any of those other moments, uh, but this is the the absolute, it seems. Um, and I suggested a few minutes ago that uh, the template of the Lord's Prayer is actually behind all of this or structuring this. So it's one thing to learn the Lord's Prayer, to use that in your devotional life. But here, Jesus is living it in the yeah. most intense way. That's and it's a, you know, tremendous lesson for us to understand what those very, very simple words mean. I'd never quite thought about it that way, Peter. And I'm guessing some of our listeners or viewers feel the same way. That I think that's a very profound idea. 
that what he had once what he once offered as a as a lovely prayer has now become his prayer yes uh, as he lives it out yes well said you know uh peter recently i was thinking about this whole occasion in fact it was this past sunday i was reflecting on this once again uh, i love these these particular chapters of course this is the climax toward which jesus has been moving and um and, and as I was thinking about them, what came to mind was the epistle to the Hebrews. Hmm. These verses uh, seem to me to sort of, sort of summarize well. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, and I love this part, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What Christ has done for us and what if and if we receive it in faith really does sort of empower us to go with confidence before God and and uh, and approach him because of what he's done for us that we could never do for ourselves. And so I've been, I'm, I'm appreciative we're able to talk about this. And we'll, in, in our future ones, we'll talk about uh, the cross and so forth. But uh, I think this, this gives us insights into the person of Jesus, like perhaps nowhere else. The Jesus, the human, Jesus, the God. Yes. Um, Imagine not knowing about this episode in his life. Oh, it would be a lovely story. But this is the crescendo. This teaches so much. Yeah. Well, it's been wonderful to be with you. We remind you that uh, that the foundation, the, the John A. Witzow Foundation, is a 501c3 uh, organization. Um, we operate completely here by uh, the blessing and kindness of people like yourselves. We hope that you will take occasion, if you feel appropriate, to contribute to what we do here. Um, that money would go toward helping us do things like we're doing here, a podcast, but also to conduct uh, dialogues with people, other Christians, for example. We look forward to being with you once again. Thanks for joining us.